True Crime Fix is a podcast with adult themes and graphic descriptions of crime which may not be considered suitable for all ages. Please use your discretion when listening. All research has been conducted using material in the public domain and some opinions may not be that of the author or the host. Please remember that all victims are someone's loved one and all episodes are recorded in the utmost respect of their memory. You're listening to the True Crime Base Podcast with your host, Steve. Hello again everyone, and welcome to our 34th case together. If you've enjoyed the show so far, please make sure that you've subscribed on your chosen podcast directory and all of the new episodes will automatically download for you upon release. You can also listen to the new episodes through the website too. So just go over to www.truecrimefixpodcast.co.uk and all of the episodes are at the base of the home screen. The episodes are also available now on YouTube on the True Crime Fix channel. They're usually uploaded the Friday after the release as a podcast, so please, if you enjoy the show, spread the word as far as possible. I would also like to welcome Fallon and Dorothy to the True Crime Fix Patreon family. I really appreciate the support. If you want to join Fallon and Dorothy, please come over to www.patreon.com forward slash true crime fix podcast this is the last episode of the season and i want to once again pass on my heartfelt thanks to everyone for staying with me this season i'm going to take a couple of weeks break as i'm somewhat burnt out and i want to be able to be the best version of me that i can be when i'm doing these episodes rather than getting to the stage where I'm producing tired, substandard content, not doing the victim's stories any justice. If you miss me during the break, there are two bonus episodes available on the True Crime Fix Patreon page. Before we go on to this week's case, I just want to share something with you. If you've listened to every episode in this series, not including this episode, that is 95,992 words of mine that you have heard and 13 hours and 17 minutes of your time you have spent with me. So for that, I thank you. So this week's case was due to unforeseen circumstances, a change to the one that I had planned. But it's a perfect episode to end this season with, especially as it fits in with Pride Month which has just ended. This case is dealing with a hate crime and the victim being murdered because of who they are. Okay, just a small disclaimer. Some of you may notice that I'm going to use different pronouns in this episode to refer to the same person. That is out of respect to our victim. I'll be referring to them by their name which they used at the time as much as possible, whereas direct quotations I'm not changing so if the person referred to them as a he or a she, I'll be using that. Also a warning, I try and limit the expletives in this podcast usually, but as a lot of it is direct quotation, there is a lot more than usual. If you have this on in a public workplace, I'm just giving you a slight heads up. Without further ado, this is your true crime fix, I'm your host Steve, and this episode has been dedicated to the memory of Edward Gwen Araujo. Edward Araujo Jr. was born on the exact same day as me, 24th of February 1985, in Brawley, California. Brawley is a city in the most southern part of the United States, only 24 miles from the Mexican border and 130 miles east of San Diego. Edward was the son of Edward Araujo Sr. 
and Silvia Guerrero. Edward's parents divorced 10 months after he was born and Edward Sr. would not be a significant part of his baby's life. Edward had a number of siblings, Pearl, Jesus, Rachel, Brandon and Michael. Whilst growing up, Edward would get involved with most normal things that a young child would like to do, for example, playing Little League Baseball, as well as outdoor exploring, camping and fishing. Edward's mother, Sylvia, was quoted as saying, he felt feminine and never, never felt masculine. She said that she suspected that her son was gay from when he was a toddler, as Edward would like to play with dolls and make sure that everything had a pretty appearance. At the age of 14, Edward decided to start going by the name Gwen Amber Rose, after Gwen Stefani, the lead singer of the band, no doubt. Gwen lived as a young woman from then on, growing long hair and wearing crop tops and women's jeans. Sylvia said, He felt like a girl trapped in a man's body. She struggled with how to refer to her child, refusing to use the name Gwen until the sex change operation was completed. By this time, the family had moved to Newark, a city in the most southern part of the San Francisco Bay. She said that she supported Gwen as best as she could, as dressing like a girl took guts especially in this town. She continued, other boys teased and hassled Eddie at school, calling him names. He eventually dropped out of school after his attendance and grades fell off. He never liked school because he never felt comfortable, Sylvia said. Sylvia had asked the school to make special dispensation with relation to Gwen's use of the bathroom. Gwen's older sister, Pearl, said by the time he reached junior high school, he was tormented because of his voice and the way he carried himself. Ever since he was little, I always protected him, she said. Pearl continued, but by the eighth grade, people started calling him names such as queer and f***. Gwen couldn't find a job and Sylvia believed this was because Gwen's appearance as a girl did not match the name on the job applications. In the summer of 2002, Gwen met Michael Magidson, Jaron Neighbours, Jason Cazares, and the brothers Paul and Jose Merrill, and they became good friends. Gwen began going to the Merrill's house on occasion as well, a house in St Matthew Drive in Newark, which was occupied by Jose and his two brothers, Emmanuel and Paul. To the guys, Gwen appeared to be a pretty and flirtatious girl, who acted in a sexually suggestive manner towards them on occasion. Gwen was also using the name Leader by now. Gwen's friendship with the boys was not always purely platonic and had sexual relations with Michael Magidson and Jose Merrill, participating in both oral and anal sex. The question of Gwen's gender was never broached. That was, until a fight broke out between Gwen and Paul Morell's girlfriend, Nicole Brown. The fight had occurred after Brown tried to get Gwen to perform a striptease for the guys. Brown said she urged Gwen to strip until the two began fighting. The men tried to pull them apart as Brown and Gwen exchanged punches and pulled each other's hair. They were tripping because she was smaller than me and just as strong, Brown said. She fought like a guy. Although Brown and Gwen made up after the fight, this led to Gwen's friends having doubts over whether or not Gwen was female. Everything came to a head on the evening of the 3rd of October 2002. 
there was a gathering at the Morell House on St Matthew Drive with about a dozen people present. Sylvia said Gwen had borrowed her peasant blouse and a friend's miniskirt to wear to the party. She said that it was the first time Gwen had worn a skirt out and that she offered the warning that she was afraid Gwen's physique might still look too manly. The evening had begun with an impromptu gathering that turned into a typical teenager early 20s party full of cigarette smoke and beer with a number of the party including Gwen getting increasingly intoxicated. As the group sat around a table to play dominoes, Brown and Gwen were acting as if their fight a couple of weeks earlier had not happened. Brown said in an interview later that they had taken two trips to the 7-Eleven to buy beer and cigarettes together. On one of those trips, Brown said that Gwen had confided in her that there was a crush towards both Maggidson and neighbours. On the evening of October the 3rd, 2002, Jose Merrill, Maggidson, Cazares and neighbours had gone to a bar. They stayed there for an hour or two drinking beer and cognac. They then went to a nightclub, had another round of drinks and left around 1.30am. They then went back to Jose Merrill's house. They thought Gwen would be there and on the journey they discussed about asking Gwen about whether she was a man or a woman. As they thought, Gwen and Brown were at the house when they got there. Neighbours, Maggidson, Jose Merrill and Cazares began playing dominoes and drinking at the dining room table. Gwen joined them and appeared to be intoxicated. After interfering with the game of dominoes, Merrill stood up and put his fingers across Gwen's throat. Then, ran his fingers through the front part of Gwen's hair. Slightly intimidated, Gwen asked what he was doing. Merrill responded in a demanding tone. We want to know why everyone... You want everybody to fuck you in the arse. Then asked in the same tone, Are you a woman or a sloppy arsed... Gwen looked at Merrill and Maggidson and asked, How can you ask me that? It was about 3.30am and Brown and Paul Merrill were just about to go to sleep when Brown heard raised voices from the other room in the house. Brown said that she walked into the kitchen and saw the men confronting Gwen. Are you a fucking woman or a man? Jose Merrill was screaming. Are you a man? Gwen did not respond. Brown said she called out, Why don't one of you guys find out? Maggidson then accompanied Gwen to the bathroom. While the two were gone, Brown said the others told her some of them had had sex with Gwen. Brown said she tried to reassure the men that Gwen was definitely a woman. After half an hour, Maggidson and Gwen were still in the bathroom, so Brown said she decided to go in. Gwen was sitting on the sink and appeared to be very drunk. Brown asked Gwen if she was alright, but Gwen didn't answer Brown's questions. I opened her legs, Brown said. She then placed her hand up Gwen's skirt and felt Gwen's genitalia. Then Brown recalled screaming, It's a fucking man! Oh my god! Chaos ensued, with Jose Merrill, according to witnesses, vomiting and starting to cry and saying, I'm not gay! Maggidson was wild-eyed and distraught. Merrill stayed inside and hung around by the bathroom whilst Maggidson, neighbours and Cazares went outside to smoke cigarettes. 
Brown said she began pleading with Jose Merrill to let the evening end peacefully. I said, let her go, let her walk out that door, Brown recalled. Gwen stepped out of the bathroom and Maggidson pulled Gwen to the floor and moved Gwen's underwear to the side, revealing testicles. He put his arm around Gwen's throat. Whilst Gwen was struggling to get free, Emmanuel approached, pulled on Maggidson's arm to get off Gwen and told him to let go. Maggidson did so. Emmanuel tried to push Gwen out the front door, but Maggidson and neighbours prevented him. Maggidson again began choking Gwen and Emmanuel tried to pull him away as Gwen struggled. Maggidson again let go. Emmanuel left the area and Maggidson immediately put a chokehold back on Gwen and appeared to be applying force to Gwen's neck. Nicole Brown said, When I knew at that point they were so angry, I couldn't stop it. That's when I left. I know Paul and Jose, and I know they wouldn't do anything, but I didn't know those other guys that well, so I was scared. She ran back to Paul Morell's room and got him up to leave. She said that because he was on probation, he did not want to be involved in any trouble. She was also afraid because she had two children of her own. The two left with Morell's older brother, Emmanuel, to drive the 25 miles to Brown's apartment in Livermore. Leaving Gwen alone in the house with neighbours, Cazares, Maggidson and Jose Morell. In the living room, Gwen was in a kneeling position and neighbours saw Jose Morell and Maggidson standing over Gwen. Gwen received two slaps to the head area from each man. Gwen was pleading, No, please don't. I have a family. Morel left the living room and returned with a food can in his hand, then struck Gwen on the top of the head with the can, hard enough to dent it. Gwen fell to a seated position, hair matted, and wet with what appeared to be blood. Morell left the room and came back with a frying pan in his hand. He told Maggidson to get out of the way, then hit Gwen hard with the frying pan on the crown of the head near the hairline. Gwen fell to the floor. Neighbours moved towards Cazares, who asked him, Are you down? Neighbours understood that to mean that Cazares was asking whether he had their back, meaning whether he was with them or against them. Neighbours said he was, later saying he was on the understanding that he was agreeing to participate in harming Gwen. Cazares asked Maggidson for his keys and Maggidson handed them to Cazares. Neighbours and Cazares left the house and they got into Maggidson's truck. Cazares said they were going to get some shovels so they could kill that bitch. They went to Cazares' house. During the ride, Cazares told neighbours that Gwen had told him that she was related or had some protection from members of a local gang and that Gwen had offered him money to help her get out of the house. They got three shovels and a pickaxe from the shed at Cazares' house and returned to the Morel house. When they entered the house, Gwen was sitting on the couch but was still conscious. There was blood on Gwen's face. Magidson and Morel were standing in front of Gwen. Morel was holding a dumbbell bar that had some weights attached to it. Magidson left the room and came back with a rope and asked neighbours for his knife. 
neighbours handed him the knife that he carried in his pocket. Morel had told Gwen to get off the couch and he began scrubbing the blood off of it. Magidson left the room again and returned with a bundle of rope. Cazares told Magidson, knock that bitch out. Neighbours said, yeah, knock that bitch out. Magidson went up to Gwen, who was then struck twice in the face with a closed fist. Magidson then punched Gwen twice in the head and kneed Gwen so hard the impact caused a dent in the wall behind Gwen's head. Jose Morel was frantically scrubbing Gwen's blood from the sofa still. Magidson bound Gwen's wrists and ankles with the rope. Worried that Gwen was bleeding on the carpet, Morel, Magidson and neighbours wrapped Gwen in a blanket and carried Gwen, who was by now only semi-conscious, into the garage. The two men then tied a rope around Gwen's neck until they believed that Gwen was dead. To ensure that that was the case, Jason Cazares struck Gwen in the face twice with a shovel. After the attack, they wrapped Gwen's body up and put it on the back of Magidson's truck. With Gwen's body in the bed of the truck, the four men drove for nearly four hours and just over 180 miles to a campsite Cazares and Magidson knew about. They got onto the freeway and someone suggested throwing Gwen off of a bridge. Magidson said he had not been sure whether or not Gwen was dead until Cazares hit Gwen with a shovel a couple of times. Cazares responded, fuck the dumb shit. According to neighbours, during the subsequent investigation, the attackers stopped twice en route to their destination, once to cover up Gwen's feet, which had become exposed on the journey, and then again to fill up with petrol. The area that they had decided to drive to was just off of Silver Fork Road in the El Dorado National Forest, an area to the south of Lake Tahoe. They had camped there before, and knew, for an unexplained reason, that only one sheriff patrolled the area. When the men reached the area that they had chosen to be Gwen's final resting place, they used the tools which Cazares had collected from home, dug a hole until, to quote neighbours, we didn't think we could dig any more. Magidson grabbed Gwen from the back of the flatbed, and dragged the lifeless body into the hole. The four men then proceeded to cover Gwen with heavy rocks, dirt and a tree trunk. According to neighbours, the men continued to insult Gwen throughout. I said I couldn't believe that someone would ever do that, would be that deceitful, neighbours said. Jose said, He was so mad that he could still kick her a couple more times. When they ensured that they were satisfied they had covered up their crime, they got back into the truck and drove to a McDonald's drive-thru where they ordered breakfast. I'm just going to leave this as a little nugget for you to think about as this case continues. There was reportedly a dozen people at that party at the start of the night. How many of those were left to witness anything? Gwen wasn't reported missing until over 24 hours later, on the 5th of October 2002. Gwen's mother filed a missing persons report, telling the police she was worried, even though Gwen sometimes stayed away from home. Despite that, Gwen always checked in with Sylvia. Police did not initially take the missing persons case seriously, partially because Gwen was transgender 
and partially because Gwen was known to stay away from home overnight. But soon, rumours spread quickly around Newark, whose population was around 42,000. Within days of Gwen's disappearance, Aunt Amelda Guerrero notified the local police department of what she described as fourth-hand rumours. According to what was being said locally, a girl had had anal sex with at least one male, and when they found out the girl was in fact a male, they killed him and buried him at Lake Tahoe. Lieutenant Lance Morrison of the Newark Police Department said the investigation unfolded like a giant game of telephone among a small circle of teenagers and adults who either had attended the party or heard about it later. Every nugget of information we got tended to reinforce that something very bad had happened, he said. A few days after Gwen was reported missing, a friend of Jaron Neighbours described him as appearing distraught. Neighbours had confessed to a friend what the four had done shortly after returning from the gravesite. That friend tipped off the police and agreed to wear a microphone during a subsequent conversation with Neighbours about the murder. During their conversation, neighbours indicated that he was afraid. According to the court records, neighbours talked about how the police wanted him to reveal what had happened at the party. I'm not knocking on anybody, neighbours reportedly told his friend. When the friend told him not to worry, neighbours responded, I have to worry. When the friend said everything would be okay, neighbours interrupted, No, it ain't, dude. The police officer knew everything, dude. He knew everything. When the police confronted neighbours with the recording on the 15th of October, neighbours broke and led the police to where the four men had buried Gwen. When Gwen was found, they had buried her three feet deep and placed three large boulders on the grave so that animals could not dig the body up. The heaviest one was placed on Gwen's head to the extent that it crushed her head and the side of her face. It took three sheriff deputies to remove it. Once Gwen's body was recovered, a subsequent autopsy revealed the marks from the ropes showed Gwen was either unconscious or dead when she was tied up. The cause of death was asphyxia due to strangulation associated with the blunt trauma to the head. There were two lacerations on Gwen's upper forehead, with hemorrhaging inside the scalp. The blows were caused by a hard, blunt object, which could have been a heavy-duty frying pan a can of food if applied with enough force, a shovel or a weight. Basically, any of the blows alone could have caused irreparable damage. Altogether, Gwen stood no chance. The coroner ruled both the strangulation and the blunt force trauma as potentially fatal, and death could have occurred from the blunt force trauma to the head even if Gwen had not been strangled. The police decided that they had enough to charge. They already had Geron neighbours, so the Alameda County Sheriff's Department dispatched officers to arrest Jose Morel, Michael Magidson, and also Paul Morel. I've tried to search everywhere for an explanation as to why Paul Morel was arrested with the other two, but I can't find anything online. Nicole Brown and Emmanuel Morell, however, confirmed his alibi that he was with them and Paul Morell was released without charge. Jose Morell, Neighbours and Magidson all appeared before Alameda County Superior Court. 
Attorney Robert Bellez entered a plea of not guilty of murder in the courtroom of Judge Dennis McLaughlin on behalf of neighbours. The other two men, Magidson and Morell, did not enter pleas at this point. On Friday the 25th of October 2002, the funeral of Gwen took place at St Edward's Church in Newark. For the funeral, there was a service for family and close friends in the morning, followed by an afternoon service which was open to the public. Hundreds of people filed somberly past the open casket. The theme of the service was the butterfly, which was Gwen's favourite symbol. The oak casket was adorned with a large cloth butterfly and bunches of flowers. Take your flight, beautiful butterfly, take your flight, said Gwen's aunt Amelda Guerrero in her short emotional eulogy. Family members said they felt Gwen would want to be buried as a woman and they honoured that. Gwen was laid to rest in a dark dress. Later, more than 700 people packed into St Edward's for the funeral, many standing outside when there was no more room. I believe that our lives are changed now, said Father Jeff Finley. I believe, I want to believe, that we will be able to say to each other, I appreciate who you are. During the service, Gwen's family released 17 butterflies, one for each year of Gwen's life. His tombstone will say Gwen, Sylvia said. She continued, This kid was a great kid, and he suffered so much. He's my Gwen, and he's beautiful. I just wish I could have saved him from this. Gwen's body was then cremated, and the family took possession of the ashes. Whilst he was in prison, awaiting his trial, neighbours had written a letter claiming that the men had discussed a soprano-type plan to kill the bitch and get rid of her body. He had written the letter for a girlfriend after his arrest and whilst he was in Santa Rita Jail in Dublin, California. Sheriff's officials intercepted the letter. As a result, Jason Cazares was arrested on the 18th of November. Prior to the letter, the police believed that he was only a witness. On the 24th of February 2003, what should have been Gwen's 18th birthday, neighbours pled guilty to the lesser charge of involuntary manslaughter. This charge had been agreed with the district attorney in exchange for him to testify against his co-defendants. Although his plea had been entered into the court, Judge Burr warned neighbours, you can still be charged with murder if you don't keep up your end of the bargain. The plea deal meant that neighbours would be sentenced to 11 years. On the first anniversary of Gwen's death, Sylvia said to SF Gate, the sister website of the San Francisco Chronicle, that life had been difficult for the family. She revealed that she had broken up with her boyfriend of more than four years, seen her best friend move back to Mexico, and lost her job as a legal assistant at a San Jose law firm because she couldn't concentrate. Her 13-year-old son, Brandon, who used to earn straight A's in school, failed almost every class. As a result, he had moved to Virginia to live with his father. Everyone should hug their children, because tomorrow is not promised to any of us, she said. She quoted a favourite line of Gwen's. Live as though this is your last day. 
On Monday, the 15th of March 2004, the trial of Merrill, Majidson and Cazares began with the jury selection. About half of the hundred prospective jurors asked to be excused from serving for various reasons, such as impending vacations, sickly relatives or the financial hardship stemming from missing work during the trial. Superior Court Judge Harry Shepard dismissed many of those people. Potential jurors were asked on the questionnaire whether they knew anyone who is lesbian, gay, bisexual or transgender. Whether they knew any same-sex couples that were recently married. And whether they had ever met any transgender people. The prospective jurors were also asked whether they had seen a movie or theatrical performance depicting the activities of a transgender person, although no specific films or plays were mentioned. The first trial began on April the 14th, 2004. The three men had been charged with murder, which included a hate crime element which, if found guilty, would contain an additional four years on any sentence. The trial took place at Alameda County Superior Court in Fremont, and the attorneys for all of the defendants made a not guilty plea. An interesting point to note is that the prosecuting assistant district attorney, Chris Lemero, used male pronouns and Gwen's birth name throughout saying in his opening statement that the defendants had decided, I quote, the wages of Eddie Araujo's sin of deception was death. Make no mistake about it, Eddie's death was an execution. It was this cast of characters that would snuff out his life, stick him in a hole in the forest and then head off to McDonald's for breakfast. In opening statements, Magidson's attorney, Michael Thorman, said the killing was manslaughter, not murder. According to neighbours, Magidson and Morell had had sex with Gwen. Thorman said that the shock of learning that he had unwittingly had sex with a man upset Magidson beyond reason the gay panic defence. The gay panic defence is a legal strategy in which a defendant claims they acted in a state of violent or temporary insanity committing assault or murder because of unwanted same-sex sexual advances. Cazares' attorney Tony Serra said his client tried to protect and never struck Gwen. Neighbours had testified at his trial that Cazares had admitted hitting Gwen on the head with a shovel after Gwen was strangled to ensure that Gwen was dead. Sarah said that this was not true and that he would try and show jurors that Neighbours was not credible. The jury heard the information which was described in this podcast. The approach which the defence teams took was to attack the state witnesses' credibility. Under cross-examination by Cazares attorney, Sarah, neighbours admitted that he had lied during the initial police interviews in October when he claimed that he, Michael Magidson and Jose Merrill carried Gwen's body into Merrill's garage. But in testimony at his trial, Neighbours said he, Magidson and Cazares carried Gwen's body while Merrill was inside wiping away the blood. Sarah noted that neighbours who led police to Gwen's body had earlier claimed to detectives that he did not know where Gwen was and that is the honest to God truth. That was a bold faced lie, wasn't it? Sarah said. Correct, neighbours answered. When you lie, 
Because you are articulate and because you're willing to bring God into it, you're a pretty successful liar, aren't you? Sarah asked, prompting the judge to find the question argumentative. Sarah tried again, asking, That is the method you employ to make people believe your lie. Neighbours who had previously testified that he had found Jesus Christ whilst in jail, responded, When I was agnostic, yes. The trial was thrown off course on Monday the 19th of April, when Nicole Brown tearfully declared that she was not up to testify. Brown, who had begun testifying on the prior Thursday, and was expected to describe the chaotic scene that ensued the night she followed Gwen into the bathroom and confirmed the group's growing suspicion that the beautiful girl they knew as Leader was biologically male. But with a mumbled, I can't do it today, Brown declined to answer the questions. Judge Harry Shepherd called for a recess to give Brown chance to compose herself, but later excused her. Judge Shepherd told jurors that Brown had experienced some recent distress that's totally unrelated to this case in all respects. This trial did not end how anybody wanted it to, when on the 22nd of June, Judge Shepherd declared a mistrial. Gasps and muffled cries from Gwen's family were heard when Judge Shepherd announced that the panel of eight men and four women were hopelessly deadlocked on the first degree murder counts against Jason Cazares, Michael Magidson and Jose Morel. The jury foreman told the judge that after nine days of deliberations, two jurors believed that Morel and Cazares were guilty of first degree murder, with ten disagreeing. They also could not agree on Magidson, where seven jurors had voted to convict him of first degree murder, whereas the other five could not be swayed. Prosecutor Chris Lemero said immediately that he would retry the three men and set a July 30th date to begin the process. Outside court, Lemero said he was frustrated by the outcome but that he believes another jury would be able to reach a unanimous verdict. The defence lawyers, however, criticised the jury's acknowledgement that they never got past the first degree charge and blamed the one or two jurors who would not budge. The three defence attorneys remained upbeat about their clients' chances at a second trial. The retrial commenced on the 31st of May 2005. Again, Judge Harry Shepard presided. This trial was different, however. For this new trial, Judge Shepard ordered attorneys not to speak to the media, eliminating the spin control and grandstanding that sometimes goes on outside the courtroom. Also, unlike the first trial, Defence lawyers referred to Gwen as female. A programme director for the San Francisco non-profit group Community United Against Violence, Connie Champagne, stated calling Gwen she the way she always wanted it. The day after the first murder trial, Gwen's mother legally changed her name posthumously from Edward Araujo Jr. to Gwen Amber Rose Araujo. Connie Champagne blogged about most of the second trial and described the prosecution's opening statements. I quote, Lomero methodically presented the events, culminating with a statement I felt really resonated, that these defendants were not who they seemed to be. Gwen Araujo thought these men were her friends. She did not know they were pathetic, angry and weak. 
since the defence had attacked Gwen's character relentlessly in the last trial. It begs to question, who really deceived who? Nicole Brown also testified at the second trial, and she detailed how angry some of the men became upon learning that Gwen was physically male. Brown also told the jury that she called Morell the following day to ask what had become of Gwen, and he told her, let's just say she had a long walk home. A different approach was taken by the new lawyer who was representing Morell. William Dubois described the relationship between neighbours and Morell as commercial and challenged that the amount of marijuana which had been smoked by neighbours, which incidentally had been sold to him by Morell, meant that his recollections were somewhat off. On the 20th of June, the medical examiner Dr Sharon Van Meter took to the stand. She had been a doctor of pathology for over 30 years and provided medical services to the Alameda County Coroner's Office. Dr Van Meter examined the body and determined the cause of death to be asphyxia in association with blunt force trauma to the head. The victim was alive at the time of strangulation and she may or may not have been conscious. The trauma alone could have been fatal. Cazares' lawyer, Mr. Serra, cross-examined. Serra. What instrument caused the trauma or lacerations? Could it have been a can? Van Meter, yes. Serra. Frying pan? Van Meter, yes. Serra. A shovel? Van Meter, yes. Sarah. A weight? Van Meter, yes. Sarah. You can't tell us exactly what caused the trauma. Van Meter, no, I can't. The court was told that one of the distinct characteristics that define a hate crime is the overkill factor, the extreme violence that the perpetrators use. Van Meter testified that there were indeed a number of post-mortem lesions over Gwen's body. A large number of areas over the back, abdomen, knees, left half of the chest, right forearm, right thigh, right knee, and back of the left forearm. In other words, they were still beating the life out of her when she was already dead. Van Meter testified that nearly four feet of rope was used. She also testified that there were numerous lengths of rope used and that the free ends were knotted. Gwen's wrists were bound multiple times. The rope extended down the side of Gwen's body, around Gwen's ankles and around Gwen's chest. On the 30th of August 2005, Mr. Lamero gave his closing statement in rebuttal to the defence's claims, which basically indicated that Gwen's deception had brought this all upon herself. This is a direct quote. So then, this must have been suicide. She just must have killed herself. He sarcastically proclaimed that this must have been her wanting to die that she wanted to die because she spoke up for herself, as she was being beaten and as she knew she was going to die because of it. How dare she try and stop this? The defence wants the jury to believe that there was no premeditation, no malicious afterthought, that Magidson is to be protected by casting reasonable doubt as to whether this was planned so the assistant district attorney asked the jury to ask themselves what motivates an advocate, a defence lawyer? They want to prevail of course but what motivates them more is the fear that they won't be believed that the jury won't give them what they want 
In closing, Lomero asked that Jason Cazares and Michael Magidson be convicted of first degree murder. But if they concluded that there was not enough evidence for this, that they convicted them of second degree and that they all unanimously agreed to bring back a murder conviction. The ADA said he wanted to give justice to the victim and peace to her family. He further stated that he left the fate of Jose Morel up to them, that they have to weigh the evidence and decide his level of guilt in this crime. On September the 12th, 2005, Michael Magidson and Jose Morel were found guilty of second degree murder. This carried with it a sentence of 15 years to life. Jason Cazares' case, however, ended in mistrial. The jury were deadlocked on Cazares, voting 9-3 to three in favour of a murder conviction. To avoid a third trial, Cazares pleaded no contest to manslaughter on December the 16th, 2005, and was sentenced to six years in prison. So what has happened since the trial? In September 2006, California Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger signed the Gwen Araujo Justice for Victims Act into law. The law allows a judge to instruct jurors not to consider their own anti-LGBTQ biases during their deliberations. Jason Cazares was released from prison in July 2012 having served six and a half years. On the 10th anniversary of Gwen's murder, Sylvia had agreed to meet with Jose Morel at Soledad State Prison, where he was serving his sentence. She said, I've been talking on and off with the Morel family for years. She said that of the four men, Morel has always been remorseful. It's kind of scary, but I think it's time, she said of the visit. I think he owes it to Gwen, and he owes it to me. Sylvia suspected that a lot more happened to Gwen than was testified to in the courtroom. She said, I need to know the truth. I don't think I'll ever be at peace, but the truth will set us free. She said, that she long ago forgave the four men. I forgave them all. It's me. It's my faith. Morel, who has expressed remorse from the beginning, admitted when interviewed by the Mercury News that back when he was sentenced, he felt more sorry for himself. He said he didn't understand the depths of what he had done until his own daughter, who was gravely disabled, died in 2011. Jose Morel was granted parole in 2016 with the support of Sylvia Guerrero. Michael Magidson at the time of writing is still in prison. Unlike Morel, he has not shown remorse for his actions and his latest parole hearing in September 2019 was denied. He admitted himself that he needed help to get over his substance issues. Gwen Amber Rose Araujo would have been 35 years old. I wonder if Gwen would have completed the gender realignment surgery that she so badly wanted. Unfortunately, Gwen's death will not be the last of a transgender person. So that's it for this series. Again, Another massive thank you to everyone listening and making suggestions that will only make things better. So just to let you know that Season 4 is going to be completely different. Keep your eye out on social media and this podcast feed for further information in a fortnight or so. I'm going to take a brief break. The next full episode is going to be on the 31st of July Until then, 
please catch up on any episodes that you have missed or listen to either Steve McNair's or Harry Colston's story on Patreon. Please remember, if you enjoy the show or want to know more, please follow us on Twitter at True Crime Fix Pod. That's at True Crime Fix Pod on Twitter. The podcast also has a Facebook page, so please go to True Crime Fix Podcast. But there's also a fan page, True Crime Fix Discussion. I'm thoroughly enjoying interacting with everyone on there, and this is where I post the majority of the information on the week's cases. You can also visit the website, so please visit www.truecrimefixpodcast.co.uk Also a reminder that the podcast is on Patreon, so please visit www.patreon.com forward slash truecrimefixpodcast I also have an Instagram account and I'm using this a lot more now, so please search at True Crime Fix on Instagram. Also, if you have any suggestions or feedback for the show, please contact me at True Crime Fix Podcast at gmail.com. That's True Crime Fix Podcast at gmail.com. Or go through the Contact Us page on the website. Until next time, stay safe, look after each other, and live life to the fullest because you never know who or what might be coming around the next corner. Take care, everyone.